Um, welcome everyone in the audience. Thank you for braving the weather and welcome everyone at home. So glad you could join us. I'm Joshua Shanes, Professor of Jewish Studies here at the College of Charleston and Director of the Arnold Center for Israel Studies. And it's my pleasure to welcome our guest uh, tonight, Irvi Lawson uh, from North Carolina, who I've been introduced in a moment. But first, as we always do, we want to use this opportunity to let you know about a couple upcoming events. We have a very rich uh, set of programs this semester. I suspect that uh, Kim will be putting, for those of you at home, will be putting the link into the chat box momentarily, and you can see all of the things happening this semester. Coming up in the next week alone, and I am personally very excited for both events. Uh, one, uh, on Wednesday, September 14th at 7, at 7 p.m. Uh, at the Stern Center Gardens, which is just down the block from Jewish Studies, Gili Yalo, an Ethiopian-Israeli international musician, will be performing uh, with, uh, with his band. Uh, and it's gonna be a very unique, special opportunity for those of us in Charleston to enjoy. I would urge you to take advantage of the, uh, the opportunity. I'm certainly not gonna miss it for the world. That's Wednesday, September 14th at 7 p.m. And then a week from Sunday, we have a lecture uh, on it called, if, and as I was just saying to somebody a moment ago, I do speak a number of languages, but Spanish is not among them, so I hope I'm getting this correct. Uh, Bienvenidos a Miami, uh, how Latinx Jews remake the Jewish mainstream. That is a week from Sunday here at Arnold Hall at 10 a.m., preceded, as always, by brunch at 9 a.m. Now, it is my pleasure to begin our conversation for Abyssinda Lawson. Uh, I won't give you a whole biography because I'm hoping she'll elucidate it better than I could research online. Uh, so please tell us a little bit about uh, your journey uh, to, uh, from where you grew up, through the military, college and military, to finding, finding Judaism. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, while you were talking, I think I swallowed wrong. <laughs> and I said, coffee, and you. I like, turned the mic off because I didn't want people to hear me. So my voice is now, and I'm crying out of his eye. So, um, yeah, so my name is uh, uh, Sandra Lawson. Um, I'm a rabbi, and I work for, currently work for Reconstructing Judaism based out of Philadelphia. And um, I, go back a minute. So I um, grew up in a military family. Um, my parents were Southerners who uh, made the, the part of the generation that made the, the switch from the South to the to northern cities or western cities. And so like my dad moved from, from a tiny town called Levitt's, Arkansas to uh, St. Louis and my mom from a tiny town in St. Louis, southern part of uh, Missouri to uh, St. Louis and they met. Um, and I'm bringing this up because my parents are southern, it's like deep, deep southerners. But I didn't know they were Southerners <laughs> when I was growing up. I would go visit my grandparents, but it just didn't dawn on me that they were Southerners. And I, would, I would lived in St. Louis, and I said y'all all the time until my friends said that's weird, and then I stopped saying it. Um, but then when I uh, uh, joined the military in my 20s, and I moved to Alabama, all of a sudden I realized all these people sound like my parents. And my parents, my mother, who I, I thought was odd to me, sounded like a character from a show called Different, A Different World, uh, was a black character who had the southern accent. I was like, that sounds like my mother. Um, so, uh, so even though I, I grew up in the Midwest, when I joined the military and moved to first Alabama, then South Korea, staying in the South, a different country, <laughs> and then back to Georgia, and then moving to Philadelphia, I realized that I really am a Southerner at heart. Um, and even though I didn't grow up in the South, I just feel way more comfortable. I feel comfortable in the Midwest, but I don't like the weather. Like all four drastic seasons, it's just <laughs> like parts of the Midwest that have every season drastically, like <laughs> the worst possible way. Um, I, yeah, like so, um, and so like the, the, the slower pace, the, the milder winters uh, just work better for me. Um, so uh, I, was in the, I, I was in the military, my first military station was in, uh, uh, oh man, Anderson, Alabama. And I was a, uh, like a military police person. Um, and during my time in the military, I worked mostly with civilian law enforcement. Um, and, you know, had a lot of fun working with civilian law enforcement. Uh, every once in a while, I'll tell my wife a story that she hasn't heard yet. 
Um, and my wife is right here, by the way. That's <laughs> And we can't turn yes, I know. Which I, I, you all I, I, I confirmed you all that she's in there. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then um, I stayed in the military, and then I, when I left the military, I was in Atlanta, and uh, I went to graduate school, and I formed a really um, beautiful friendship with someone whose his name is Joshua Lesser, and. Um, He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a rabbi and he's not retired from his congregation, he's doing all kinds of cool stuff. And we just became really friends. And through that friendship, I started to learn more about Judaism. And, um, you know, it was never his intent. Like he did say once in a joke, kind of, that the people said, Did you ever think this friendship would turn into, you know, uh, Sandra being a rabbi? And he said, No, but if I did, it'd probably be a really good marketing tool. <laughs> Um, so I'm saying this because sometimes you just people enter your life and can completely change the course trajectory of where you think your life is going. Um, and I um, was in route to get a PhD in sociology. That is what I knew what to do. That was the plan that I had created for myself after I got in the military, and I knew that path. But I just felt this weird urge to do more in the Jewish community and to uh, uh, be a rabbi. And it didn't make a lot of sense to me until Alyssa, um, Alyssa Staten was ordained through HUC, the first black woman that I'm aware of, the first black woman ordained by a rabbinical school in the United States. Um, HUC is the reform yes. seminary. Yes. And um, so she was ordained in 2009. I was like, oh. Okay, I can I can do this, and so I entered RRC in 2011, and was ordained, and um, and then I got my first job. But I intentionally looked for jobs in the South because I really wanted to move back to the South, and I applied for several positions, and then finally, um, Elon University and I thought we were a good fit because uh, I didn't just want to live in the South; like it had to be a good fit. So I worked on a college campus for uh, like two and a half years, almost three years. And then the pandemic had changed a lot of stuff. And now I work um, uh, for the Reconstructionist Movement, which is where I was ordained, and uh, trying to, um, my, my title is the, the uh, Director of Racial Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, a job that I helped to create, a title that I created um, to uh, make our organization uh, move uh, towards anti-racism. And I'm saying it that way intentionally. That's probably not the language of the movement. I mean, the language of the movement sounds like that, but I'm saying that intentionally because there is no finality. There's no, like, we are anti-racist, because <laughs> it's a constant, constant you're racism. Right. That would be great. I wouldn't have a job anymore, and that's actually what I want. Um, so, um, to move towards anti-racism. So, the cool thing is, I get to help our movement do that, and I also get to the growing number of capture, the growing number of rabbinical students of color that are um, coming through RRC, which is a Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. And I also have pretty cool relationships with some uh, rabbinical students of color and other movements. Um, and um, my counterpart in the reform movement, her name is Yolanda, and her I talk quite a bit. So. Um, great. Uh, so, a couple things. Mm -hmm. uh, so for, it's interesting, we had um, a couple of years ago, we interviewed here, it was during the pandemic, so it was on, um, on Zoom, mm -hmm. um, Rabbi Shakespeare show. Oh yeah, yeah, I just, uh, you just sent me a message last time, but something else, but I didn't know that he was here. It was, well, it was, he was here. Well, yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, right. before, it was even before the vaccine, yeah. so it was, mm -hmm. we were all home now. Uh, it was a great conversation. Mm -hmm. One of the themes that came up with him was he was frustrated, uh, he's Orthodox, mm -hmm. and he was frustrated, and he, was, he is, I'm sure, still frustrated, People assume he's a convert because yeah. he's black. Right. Um, so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about entering. People might not know what Reconstructionism is exactly. Uh, what was that like? What was that movement like, that institution like? And going in as a, as a black woman, right. as a gay black woman, mm -hmm. which I think you're the first uh, gay black rabbi, what female rabbi in America. That's what they tell me. That's I don't think it's true. Your website. No, 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 no. My website doesn't say that. Oh, uh, no. No, it does not. It's my own Wikipedia. It is Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> it's not Wikipedia. What do you mean? My students insist that it was on Wikipedia. It no. A student, so this is interesting because, like, uh, a student that I know wrote a piece when I got to um, Elon. It's saying that. And it's now, 
like the Bible. <laughs> uh, and I was saying that because I, you know, I, I'm not here to out people. <laughs> right. um, and um, people live their lives the way this. So what I prefer to say is like, um, you know, one of the first, probably. Um, and just like my friend Joshua Lesser was probably the first gay man to enter a rabbinical, openly gay person to enter a rabbinical school. He doesn't like that language because again, right. uh, so, um, but I know today I am not the only uh, black, queer, lesbian rabbi in the world. And I know that for sure, mm -hmm. um, or openly one. Right. Um, but so like to your question, is it yeah. you're not familiar with the movement. Yeah, yeah, so, the, so <laughs> how much time do you have? So, <laughs> I'm getting comfortable. No, so part of my training was to sort of break down the Reconstructionist movement in a very short period of time because we get questions a lot because people don't really know what it is. And so um, when you look at the movements, um, and I'll just stick with Orthodox, uh, Conservative, uh, Reform, um, and, and the Reconstructionist movement, I'm not going with other movements, I'm going with the Humanistic Movement or Renewal, which I just learned from Suji, who's the Executive Director of Aleph. She said that the Renewal Movement is not a movement, it's a something else. So uh, so when you when you look at the Orthodox movement, the, the conservative movement, the reform movement, all those movements grew out of Judaism in Eastern Europe. And some of those folks came here and um, um, there's this guy named Dr. Rabbi Mordecai Kaplan who was a professor at the um, flagship college that trains or seminary that trains conservative rabbis. Um, and uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary, and he had some conflicts and issues with um, the ideas of chosenness, uh, super, supernatural being, like a supernatural being up there that controls things that are here on Earth, and also believed in egalitarianism. Um, all of these views were radical in the early part of the 20th century, uh, or the latter part of the, the 19th century, the early part of the 20th century, incredibly radical. Today, they're just part of our normal discourse of Judaism. And uh, when, it, when Mordecai Kaplan had no interest in breaking away from the conservative movement, but his students actually wanted to create a new movement, and out of that, the Reconstructionist movement was born. So our, our liturgy, our theology is closer to the conservative movement, even though some of our uh, social justice beliefs might be more in line with um, the conservative movement, and I'm not even sure that's true anymore. Reform. I'm sorry, yes, the reform movement. And, uh, um, and as far as like entering uh, rabbinical school, when I started thinking about it, for me, especially with its history, uh, with its foundation of egalitarianism, pluralism, um, the number of openly gay rabbis that have come through the program, uh, it felt for me like the safest place to be. And, and, and then I found myself, strangely, I woke up, kind of woke up one day and all my friends are Reconstructionist rabbis. <laughs> I'm the outlier, I'm not. <laughs> and so, uh, so I chose, it's for me, um, <clears throat> the Reconstruction Movement seemed the safest place to be uh, with all of my, my identities. Right. Um, by the way, I want to remind everybody at home that the chat box is open, or is it the Q&A? Uh, either one, I think. Uh, and if you have questions, no need to wait. We'll have an open Q&A in about 10 or 15 minutes. You can start entering them now, and we'll definitely get, hopefully, get to them before the end of the hour. Yeah. I also want to bring to your point about what, what um, you said about how shy people, how shy people believe, believe that he converted. Um, and you had, I know you had a lot of long talk with here, like last we year. Did. And um, one of the things I think she's amazing, but her organization uh, commissioned a study on Jewish demographics, particularly black uh, Jews of color demographics. And I'm not going to go into details unless we want to talk about the demographics. Because I, even though I didn't get the PhD in sociology, I do a master's in sociology, so I like the, the geekiness of the numbers. Uh, but one of the things that the study points out relating to what you just said is that we need to get rid of this idea that Jews of color, the majority of Jews of color, converted to Judaism in the United States because the study that her organization commissioned shows that about two thirds of American Jews of color were raised Jewish. It breaks it down even more than that. Uh, and so that means the minority of Jews of color do not convert to Judaism. So in the same ways that we don't know that how white people came to Judaism, we just assume they're just Jewish, that's the direction that we actually need to go to. And that, I assume, is why you, well, before we get to that, tell us about your work at Ilan University. 
which I, I told you is also a <laughs> university in which we are, uh, we have a wonderful relationship with a little bit of a friendly competition for yeah. students, uh, trying to attract students here at the yeah. and, they, and they do the same. Uh, but tell us what your work was like at, at running Hillel. No, 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 no. I was a campus rabbi, so campus I, didn't rabbi, do, I didn't have to do all the stressful stuff. Okay. Just the fun <laughs> I, have, I, have, I can tell you about this. So when I applied for the job, I didn't, I didn't do any interning at a college campus. I was looking for a job. A friend of mine said, you should check out this campus rabbi position. In my memory and retelling of the story, I remember reading the job description, and it said, like, how would you like to spend your day having coffee with students, having lunch with students? And I called the HR person from Hillel, and I was like, is this a real job? <laughs> <laughs> this is, I'm like, is this a real job? It's just like, yeah, I said, okay, I don't have any, I'm going to apply for this job. I had zero, zero campus experience. She's like, that's okay, I'm looking at your resume, you got tons of chapel experience, you'll be just fine. And so I applied for the job, I got the job. Um, so Elon is really cool because even though it's small, um, it's about 12, depending on who you ask, anywhere from 10 to 12% of the student body are, are Jews. Most of the students do not come from North Carolina, most of them come from the Northwest. Um, the previous university chaplain built this multi-faith uh, program on campus. So I got to work with an imam, I got to work with a priest, um, random Baptist minister. <laughs> um, and North Carolina. Yeah, yeah, and, and so, but he was like not that, he was also kind of mindfulness and kind of Buddhist practices. And, um, and the university chaplain was an Episcopal priest. And so working with them to, to, to do religious programming, because um, all of the religious programming on students is open to everyone. So this is like a really cool opportunity for Jewish students to see what, what it's like to go to Catholic services or to spend time with Catholic students. So then we have like these dinners, you know, Catholic and Jewish dinners or Muslim and Jewish dinners. Um, when I got there, uh, <laughs> I kind of heard um, oh, you, when they were like, students were telling me how excited they were, like, I can't wait. They are like, we can't wait for Black Shabbat. I was like, what is that? <laughs> and what I found out is they had a Black student named Alexa, who's graduated since, um, wanted to, you know, to have more sort of more Black people at Shabbat. So she created uh, Black Shabbat where students from the Center for, Relation, Center for uh, Racial Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion would come for Shabbat. Because uh, I was like, what is it like? <laughs> uh, Black Shabbat. But what I was telling Shira at dinner, um, and there's so many things that are really cool about college students, but what I found fascinating when Shira asked me was that for many of the college students I interacted with, uh, it was their first time in a Jewish space, a religious Jewish space or a Jewish space that was different than the one that they grew up with. So maybe different than the synagogue that they've gone to or different than the camp they've gone to. So you have all these people that sort of come together with different Jewish experiences, all thinking that their experience is the one. <laughs> like they all think that that's what, that's what the experience is. And so watching how that plays out sometimes, sometimes in a cool way, um, for some students, they're like, this is not what I'm used to, this is not Jewish, I don't want any part of it. Or some students are like, this is different. Let me check this out. Some students are like, okay, kind of like this, but I can, let me, let me show you some of the things I did at home. Um, and for other students who, who, who have very strong Jewish identities but didn't grow up in any kind of religious anything, this was their opportunity to try out different stuff. So all those students are coming together and I'm, I get to work with them and meet them all in the middle. And that was just a really cool experience. That's great. Yeah. Uh, and then from there, so I should put my microphone on. Um, <laughs> now it's on. Uh, so you were there for about three? Yeah, three, almost three years. Yeah. Uh, I left, I started in July of 2018, and I left in February, March, February 20, oh wow, 2021. I think. And did you, and the, the experiences there, did you have any, did the students completely accepting of everything? They, they, oh, students are great. young I mean, students today, nothing faces them. No, and you know, the things that I was, I was prepared to be, that I thought would be surprising. I learned a lot about what students' needs are, what students' expectations are. Um, and some of the things that like myself and other staff members would think would be a big deal and no big deals for students. And what I found was that students, at least the ones I work with, just really cared that I cared <laughs> and that I was present. Um, and uh, but it was all, you know, like, like high holidays were interesting, trying to like bring all these people together. 
Um, and um, one thing I'll say, when I, when I got there, um, my predecessor, who was a conservative rabbi, did not drive on Shabbat. Um, and he lived far enough away that he could not drive. And so I had all these questions early on about, do I drive on Shabbat, do I drive on Shabbat? And I was just like, I didn't understand that. And that's because the students felt really burnt out. Now, he's a wonderful man. I'm not trying to throw shade on him. But they felt very burnt out around um, creating the whole process of creating a Shabbat service. And sort of were kind of burnt out. People were coming. And, um, and what I was... The messages that I remember getting was that, well, Susan doesn't really care about Shabbat. I'm like, well, I do, and I'm in this town, and there's no other Jewish space, so I need to do like services and be quick. Um, and so I talked to some of the student leaders, and they just wanted to, like some of the, 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 the ritual chairs. Um, they just wanted to have parties, not parties, maybe I shouldn't say that, but just big dinners. They wanted to like be the party planners. And I said, okay, well, why don't, you know, I, I see you, you don't want to do services. So what if we do a quick uh, Friday night Shabbat service, and you guys can do all of the, the planning for the meals. And, but I was also up front with students. I said, I'm a rabbi, and my goal is to move us from, from nothing to eventually having a religious service every Shabbat. That is my goal. I'm not trying to force it on you. Um, and so that's, I was able to do that. We, were, we went from, like, no services so the, I think by the time I left, we had uh, like a Shabbat service um, every Shabbat, and except for one, where we'd have this this large meal um, with like uh, organized by students, and usually have centered around some topic of the day. And one cool thing is I got this call once uh, from a guy who was traveling, an older guy who was traveling through, and he wanted to know if he'd come over for our services. And I said, you're more than welcome to come. We don't actually have services. We're having a Shabbat dinner. You, you are welcome to come. You, were, you and your partner are welcome to come, but we don't actually, we're not actually having services. Well, he showed up, and the students loved entertaining him, talking to him. And I kind of forgot about that. And then I went to this conference, and this older guy comes up. He's like, do you remember me? I'm like, I'm so sorry. I don't. He said, you hosted me and my partner when we were driving through. And I was like, oh, my gosh. He's like, he's like that was the best evening. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh -oh. um, so I know at dinner we were talking, and by the way, again, uh, everyone uh, at home, in just a few minutes, we'll open up mm -hmm. to questions, so please feel free to start typing those in. But before we do that, I want to hear about your current position. I know at dinner mm -hmm. we were talking a little bit about intersectionality, the mm -hmm. topic that the students are very interested in. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your current work and how that relates to that, that subject in particular? So one thing I'll say is, um, there's so much, there's so much to say, but I'm trying to figure out where to start. So when it comes to intersectionality, it's when you take, and intersectionality, that word in particular, we're talking about black experiences of black people. You can use other words to talk about other identities, like intersecting identities. But intersectionality was a, a term that was created by Kimberly Crenshaw to sort of highlight that when you take someone who's black and they have other identities, whether they be queer or women or whatever, um, their experiences are not necessarily the same as, say, white queer women, um, gay people, or whatever. And so what, the way I often explain it to people is that intersectionality actually winds up creating new forms of discrimination for me. And what I'll say is, um, one example of this is um, I have been featured in different publications I, I do writing, uh, I've written op-eds for The Forward, um, JTA, and other, other stuff. And sometimes when folks may disagree with, with, with what I'm writing about, um, because I'm black, they, they want to throw out that I'm anti-Semitic, but they can't really do that because I have the title rep. <laughs> so what they do is in a blog post or a social media feed or something, they will try to strip away all the ways that I'm actually not Jewish, then strip away my ordination, and then say they've done all that and proven their, proven their point, therefore I'm anti-Semitic. That doesn't happen that I'm aware of <laughs> to uh, white bearded male rabbis. Um, and so my work at uh, Reconstructing Judaism actually came out of um, my own sort of pain of having to navigate uh, people's own 
uh, microaggressions of people's own racism towards me, um, and seeing how I fit into Judaism. Like, so one example I talk about, I went on a job interview as a rabbinical student, and the president of the congregation actually never asked me a single question about my life as a student, what I want to learn, why I want to serve the congregation. It was all she could not figure out how I was a rabbinical student and, and how I was going to be a rabbi. Um, and that was like one of the earlier experiences I had. Um, <clears throat> when the pandemic hit, because I have a background in the military and law enforcement and uh, a graduate degree in sociology, particularly around race, um, I started to get calls and emails from Jewish organizations, uh, Jewish organizations and congregations, and people would say to me, can you come and talk? Um, and I would, I, various things like, can you, can you explain to my congregation what is happening right now? Why, like, why are people protesting in the streets? Why are so people so angry? What is defund the police? Why are people saying Black Lives Matter? I thought all lives matter. I'm really confused here. I thought racism was over, or, um, um, I can't support Black Lives Matter because I think it's anti-Semitic, or I can't, um, I knew racism was over. I know, I know racism still exists, but I can't ignore it anymore. Could you help? And so pastorally, um, I've been able to work with, talk with congregations and sort of help navigate our history and how we got to this moment. And, um, that was interesting. I mean, that was that was an experience to do that for almost a year, plus my regular job. Mm -hmm. And um, after a while, I kind of got to a point where coming in and giving speeches and workshops. Bye, Gloria. <laughs> coming in and giving giving speeches and, and workshops was nice, but I started also having conversations with uh, other Jews of color, other rabbinical, cantoral students of color. Um, and I realized giving speeches was not enough. <laughs> I wanted to do more. So um, in my work in Reconstructing Judaism, I created an assessment to um, let's see where our congregations are. You know, no judgment. <laughs> let's just see where you are because when you come to us asking us for help, we don't know where you are. So let's just see where you are on the spectrum. Let's see where you are. And uh, so I created like a, a pilot assessment and my hope in the future is to sort of uh, take this out to all of our congregations, hopefully spread it out to whoever wants it. Uh, but I'll also be, you know, uh, mentoring our rabbinical students of color. I'll be looking at all of our policies and all of our stuff through a DEI lens. Um, I also have lots of conversations with uh, the Camp Habaya director, uh, or, and sort of helping. Like one of the conversations with him, he's one man, but like. That when you when you inter, when you have interactions with kids of color, you can't remove race from the equation. So you, race has to be factored in, even though you may not be seeing that, seeing it as a racial thing, and you're just like talking about X. You can't, X, and that will help you um, when it comes to young people of color. Thanks. Um, well, I think we should be opening up the floor to other questions. We could keep going, but uh, time I know is a factor. So I'd like to invite the uh, audience, and I'm passing you the microphone. Hang on one second. Hi, Shira. So earlier in the talk, you mentioned that the reconstruction this movement was a place where you felt very comfortable. And I was wondering, what were the specific values of the reconstructionist movement that made you feel comfortable and safe there? And if you think there's a way that Jewish communities across the world could sort of emulate those values as well. So I'll just say, yes, so I did feel comfortable, but I'll actually say, for me, it was a place where I felt like I could be, it would be the safest for me to go to rabbinical school. Um, and because I knew its values. So I came from a reconstruction synagogue for one. Um, I knew that they had the most diverse student body. I was still the first black student, but they had a, pretty diverse uh, student body compared to other schools at the time. Um, and I think there's something about a foundation that is built off of egalitarianism and pluralism. Um, I think they also had more female faculty at the time. And so 
Um, other schools also had those similar values, but that wasn't the foundation. Um, and I think there's something really special when you start a system that, that, that is focused on equity. Doesn't mean it's going to be perfect, doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes. Um, and also, I think, like, you know, people go to schools because their friends go to the schools. And, and so, like, every rabbi, with the exception of one <laughs> that I was uh, in a relationship with, went to RRC. Hi. Hi, I'm wondering if the reason people called you anti Semitic was because you're black, or were there any issues involved that happened that made you? be considered anti-Semitic. Because I, I know for me, I've been called anti-Semitic because I'm for a Palestinian mm -hmm. homeland, mm -hmm. and also I'm against the right of return to everybody, mm -hmm. especially people who weren't born in Israel. Because yeah. I don't feel that I should be allowed right. to become an automatic citizen, because mm -hmm. I have a good life elsewhere. Right, yeah. No, it's both. I think that, that um, a lot of members of the Jewish community are not aware of how racism plays into their experiences of, of black, with black people. Um, I have heard um, a lot of stuff that people believe that black people are more anti-Semitic. And what I say is that black people are not any more anti-Semitic than white people. It's just that we live in a Christian-centric society um, and we're all part of the system. So it doesn't mean that black people are more, black people can be anti-Semitic, but not any more or less. And, and I also think that um, in my case, you can find a lot written um, that I've talked about, but I don't actually talk a lot about Israel. Um, and a lot of that is because, I mean, I have my own views in Israel, uh, but I haven't felt safe enough to do so as a marginalized rabbi, to, and I felt like that would make it harder for me to do my work. But people have assumed, <laughs> um, have, some of the things that people have assumed both right and left, uh, you know, because I'm in Zionist spaces, I'm in non-Zionist spaces, people can't figure out where to put me. Um, and so uh, I have not shared my views publicly for a variety of reasons. But um, a lot, but I totally, I totally understand what you're saying because a lot of the anti-Semitic stuff is that people look at me or read about me and they just make a lot of assumptions. Thank you. Uh, other questions from the audience? Please, behind, yes, two students, one after the other, great. Hi, yeah, so I was just wondering, I personally actually discovered you through social media when your TikToks popped up. Like, uh, I was like, oh my god, you know, I buy my TikToks. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was just uh, wondering how has social media just, could, I guess, played a you know, role in yeah. your involvement with other communities, but also, mm -hmm. you know, you have a very large account, and I'm just wondering, you know, has that basically been a good opportunity for you just to meet yeah. Jewish people? Or just they feel to work with different communities. All of that, all of that. But what I'll say more, but all of that is true. But I'll also add. So initially, um, when I told that story about the president of the congregation, um, I realized that for me, I didn't want to be ordained and have to still explain my existence. So I started to use social media to educate and to teach. You know what I was like. Hey, guess what I went to school today. You know, or guess what I learned about this? You know, like so I started using various social media accounts to teach. So I've been doing that for a while. The pandemic, when the pandemic hit, and everybody was on their screen, I used it as, a, as an opportunity to build more of a prayer practice. Like, you know, I wasn't in community anywhere, uh, so I started, you know, turning on my phone, deleting uh, shakarita morning morning uh, service, um, you know, and then a Friday night service. And then, uh, and then uh, I started singing camp songs on TikTok as I was learning them. <laughs> and students just loved it because it's particularly on TikTok because at that time period, a lot of young people had lost their social, whole social network. So to be able to turn on your phone and seeing a rabbi with a guitar or a banjo or something singing a Jewish song on a Friday night or whatever, like, oh, this is like my camp. Uh, and uh, and they, they, they like that. And I still use um, social media to, to teach. And also, there's a lot of like nice, not nice players online too. Um, and, but I, ask, I answer a lot of questions. 
Um, and uh, like the, the, like for this week's tour portion, I think I, 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 I did a quick reel and a quick uh, TikTok story because Kitete has more commandments in it, a 74 compared to, we have, so, the, I put you, I don't wanna, so basically I said we have 613 commandments and as, here's an interesting thing, if you take, we have 613 commandments, not 10. If you take six plus one plus three, what do you have? <laughs> you have 10. Um, and that was the whole like, the TikTok. And people were like, I didn't think about that. So it was like this whole like conversation, like, wow, I don't know what it means. I just think it's cool. Like, <laughs> Awesome, Randy, thank you. Yes. As a spiritual leader who is deeply concerned with like equity and mm -hmm. you know interrogating like these sort of oppressive systems that underpin our society. How do you reflect on your time in the military and especially since that role involved um, a lot of work with law enforcement? My personal experience, so I come from a military family first of all. And what I think what people don't understand for black people that's different than white people. Like my dad was not a I don't know what word, I was going to say overseer, but I don't want to use that word. But hmm. like, he was just not a very, he was not a strict person. Like, the military was a job, and he didn't really talk about it until I was thinking about it. Um, he was also um, in the Vietnam War. But, and my personal experience is different than my aunts, my uncles, my dad, and my brother. I had a blast. For me, the military was fun. Uh, I, had, I had a lot of fun. And then when it got to a point where I need to make this a career or I need to decide if I really want to get that graduate degree and things happened where I was going to be stationed in an area I didn't want to be stationed in. And so I was like, okay, this is a good time to get out. But my personal experience in the military, uh, I learned a lot. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I thank the military for um, when I was in my 20s, I was kind of flighty, which is normal, actually, but I, not flight, the flight is normal, but like, the, I didn't know where I wanted to go with my life, and the direction, I didn't come from both parents, um, I didn't have, I wasn't sure the college was right for me, I would have benefited from a gap year, but that was not an option, you know, like, you must go to college, I don't think I, nobody knew what a gap year was, um, and, um, the military helped me to set goals. If I want to accomplish something, even though it may seem like it's way over there, I can backtrack and figure out how to make that happen. And so I have used the things that I learned in the military to accomplish everything I wanted to do. Um, and I, I'm always in the slow train, when I'm not trying to rush to get anywhere. <laughs> but if I want to, like for me, like being a black bear rabbi, what is that? But so I first had to learn the things that I needed to learn how to do to get that to that point. And one of the first things I did was I called the admissions guy. Right? I said, "Hey, I'm thinking about going to medical school." And somebody told me to call you. I don't know if you don't know who I am. Um, and we talked, and I still talk to her name because now she's the executive director of the Reconstructionist Movement. Um, and I just stayed in contact with her for six years. Just keep checking in, and I still give that advice to people, like. If you were thinking about going to medical school, build relationships with the admissions director. And here's the funny thing. Her name is Amber, Rabbi Amber Powers. And so I didn't have any of the skills at first. Like I didn't know, I didn't know Hebrew, I didn't know any of the things. And she was like, okay, this is what you need to do. And I, so I started doing those things. And I, one of those things is I, was, I took, um, I was taking a biblical Hebrew course. She was like, no, 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 you need to dig for a lot of Hebrew. I said, what? Like, okay, so I did that. And then the curriculum started to change at RRC and they were making some changes. I know this is more than you asked for us. <laughs> um, and um, she said, I think you should apply now. But I said, but I haven't done all the things that you said I need to do. I'm not there yet. And she's like, no, I think you need to apply. And we're applying. And I was like, what's wrong with her? So two friends of mine said to me, who were rabbis, who went to the same school, like you need to listen to her because her job is to you know, to help people apply. Her job is also to tell you if you're not a good candidate, that the admissions director of the college you want to go to is telling you to apply to apply. So anyway, I'm saying all that to say, I believe that the reason I've been able to accomplish that, a lot of that came from the values that I learned in the military. I'm not trying to sell the military on anybody. The military has a lot of messed up things, 
Uh, and like I said, my experience is very different than my brother's experience, very different than my father's experience. Um, but it was good for me. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions coming in from, yeah, please, get, Kim has one from the uh, chat. Professor Gibbs, do you want to read the, uh, <laughs> into the microphone. So we try to put this together. Um, it's prefaced on growing up in the South and feeling comfortable with Southernness. The question begs like, what about the racism of the South? Mm -hmm. um, were you uh, aware of it, um, of course, and then also, what about the racism in the military? So progressing through those phases of your life. So what I'll say is that the racism, racism, people are not any more racist in the South than they are in the North. It just looks different. Um, I haven't lived anywhere in this country where I haven't experienced racism. Like, I don't think that place exists. You know, the military is interesting because I was so young. Um, the military is a great level. It doesn't mean I never saw racist things in the military. Because I remember one time going to the sergeant's room, and he had a uh, they had this, these vents on the door, and the door, what he used to cover up the vent was a Confederate flag, and I was shocked by that. Um, and as was my supervisor, who was also a black man. <laughs> um, and so, but it is a great leveler because what's supposed to happen in the perfect world is that you're all green because that's what you're wearing. Um, and, uh, you know, that you are, you know, the military cares, at least in the army anyway, cares about how fit you are. Um, and I also had, um, there, were, there were also some racist experiences that I, that I had, but none of those like interfered with anything. But I also grew up with black parents who educated me and taught me um, the things that I need to know to survive as a black person. I'm looking at you. I know you didn't ask, ask you did ask the question, but I should be anyway. Exactly. I should be looking at the camera. Yeah. Um, I'll be that face. Yes. <laughs> um, but I think one of the things I think is interesting is that we do like to tell these stories that, you know, racism, we're talking about this at dinner, that you know, racism doesn't exist in the north, or uh, race the north has always been better to black people. No, it's just different, different, different levels, different categories. But I have not been anywhere in this country where that I have lived where I haven't encountered something racist. But what, what I will say, one of the things that I appreciate about the South, so I was, my wife, when, when I was trying to convince her to move to the South, uh, and we were somewhere, and I might be making the story up wrong, Susan, but she was driving somewhere and she saw a Confederate flag. And I said, she's like, there's a Confederate flag. And I said, see, we don't have to go there. Like, we just don't have to go over there. <laughs> that is not the case in the North. Like, you just can be somewhere and get slapped with, like, somebody's overtly racist behavior. Interesting. It must have been during the 2020 uh, Black Lives Matter, high, sort of the high point of that movement, protests, defund the police. Mm -hmm. That must have been an interesting year for you being connected to law enforcement in your past, coming to it in this way as, as being black, right. being Jewish and a rabbi, and with this law enforcement connection. Yeah, and so one of the things that, that, that yeah, because I have been able, I hope I've been able to help people have more nuance around it. One of the things I say, when, when I heard, and when I hear defund the police, I don't hear, let's get rid of law enforcement. What I hear is we are, and we are creating all this funding for military style equipment for civilians. Like the stuff I saw, I, I grew up around Ferguson. When I saw weapons of the weapons of war, weapons that I was trained on or did training with, used to squash or try to squash uh, peaceful protesters who were just chanting and marching, that was really hard for me. Uh, but like I said, like when I, you know, like when, when many white people hear defund the police, they just like you don't want any police, and, and and there might be black and brown people who don't want police. But we do have to admit that we have a system that is actually not, in many cases, it is not about securing the safety of people. I and mean, when you look at the number, of, when you look at how, well, we're all we all see this on social media now. When you look at 
the stories that we see of how white people are treated at traffic stops versus black people are treated at traffic stops. I'll give you this example. You know, um, I've really, I have a closer relationship with my dad than I have had in a long time. And so I remember the first time I got pulled over for, I don't know what, uh, 16 or whatever. Uh, I get home and he grills me on all these questions about what the police officer said, you know, what happened. And I was just like, dad, dad, was it? and I, and he didn't, in his effort to protect me looking back on it, he was worried <laughs> that something bad had happened. He wanted to make sure that I was okay. But also not saying like, you know, please do these bad things. And another thing too, I remember there was um, somebody in our neighborhood had done something bad or to somebody, I don't know. And somebody had knocked on the door and I looked out the window and there was like police everywhere, but not like police car, like you see jackets that say police or FBI. And I was like, ooh. And somebody knocked on the door and they had a uniform and had proper documentation. And I opened the door through the street and he's like, you know, they're showing me a picture, whatever they're looking for. Um, I get home, I was like, Dad, my dad comes home, I was like, Dad, you don't know, believe what happened. He's like, you open the door. And I was like, how do you know there are police? I'm like, Dad, there are police everywhere. Like, this is like the safest place to be. <laughs> but now I know, like he, you know, he was really concerned about that. Um, did you, did I see you looking at the screen? Other questions from the audience? We still have just a few minutes left. Please, yeah. Um, you can use the microphone though. How do you define Jewish people? Can you say more? Like, uh, it's a great question. I just want to get, yeah. Like, how would you define like people who are Jewish? Like, I don't know. How yeah. So, I mean, I hope I'm answering this because it's a broad. Think of what it means to be Jewish, something like yeah. That. So, this might be more of a religious answer. Um, so, so in the Torah when we learn that Moshe Rabbeinu, we learn that um, the Israelites are free and they follow, what I, excuse me, I have to teach this to young people, so I like to be funny, but you know, we, the, the um, Israelites learn that they're, they're, they're free, and so they're going to follow Moshe Rabbeinu, this guy who hears voices in the desert, um, and um, they're leaving Mitzrayim. I like Mitzrayim because I don't like using Egypt, because it's interesting when white people start talking about being uh, free from an African country. <laughs> but, but the Hebrew is better because it's a place of pain, a place of constriction, a place that caused us pain. So anyway, when we left Mitzrayim, we were a bunch of different people. Some of us were Israelites, some of us were Egyptians, some of us were who knows what. And we all follow Moses into the desert to get to this mountain, Mount, Mount Sinai. And at that mountain, when we receive the Torah, we receive, you know, you know, says God spoke to everyone in languages, the language that he or she could understand. Um, we go from being like this, this ragtag group of people to uh, one people. And, you know, there's some mythology around, you know, we were all present at Mount Sinai. And so, if you're a Jewish person, you are a member of that tribe, a tribe of people who were at Mount Sinai. And today, we're a religion, because Christianity at some point came along and said, you're a religion. We don't fit neatly into the definition of religion because we were a people first in our religion. And I'm saying all this to say that you can be part of the people and not practice the religion, but the reverse can't be true. You can't practice the religion and not be part of the people. I mean, people probably can, but you get my point. So um, we are people who are descended from that story. Is that helpful? No. <laughs> we're all trying to figure out. Yeah. I, I've been trying to figure out for three years since I was in college. Yeah, but I think it's like, if we're all part It's a lifelong of, struggle to figure it out. I yeah, think. and we're all part of this, this narrative. Um, that you're either uh, were raised with, born with, converted into, um, but we're all part of it. In the same way that, like, probably you are a citizen of this country because you were raised in this country, born in this country, and um, 
you buy into the mythology of this country or you were naturalized into this country. And that's what makes you a US citizen. Sure, hi. Um, so as, as far as I have seen, one of the only rabbis on TikTok or on Facebook. There's a few of us. There, there yeah. are definitely a few yeah. that has appeared on my For You page consistently. <laughs> time and time again. How do you balance representing the Jewish community while also just like how, I don't know, see Gordon Ramsay, not all chefs are like Gordon Ramsay, but mm -hmm. also just like showing that like your representation of the Jewish community, that you are not the Jewish community. Have you struggled with that? Is that I'm just me. I, I can only be me. Um, I don't want to present something online that's not me. And sometimes, and also, I do like I do when I'm going to make a TikTok. Sometimes, like I'm just answering a question, I might just answer the question. But I take a lot of thought into the teaching, and if I feel like it's not authentic, I feel like I'm just repeating something I heard. I just I won't do it. Um, and I never, you know, there, the diversity makes us stronger. There is so much, there's so much diversity in the Jewish community, and I try to honor that. There are people who don't want to. There are people that believe uh, there's only one way to be Jewish, and I don't, I don't subscribe to that. And I've had some people reach out to me, young people say, well, what do you say to Rabbi X or so-and-so who says you're not Jewish and doesn't understand my patr doesn't recognize a patr patrilineal descent? I'm like, don't go there. Like, you don't have, that person doesn't have to be your rabbi. Right? That person, you don't have to be in that community. And if you want to be in that community, then you're going to have to figure out a way to be part of that community with its with its rules and stuff. You know, but if you're a reformed person and you're happy in the reform movement, who cares what Orthodox Rabbi X says that you're not? <laughs> yeah. You must have experienced. I know Miriam Anzavin when she became mm -hmm. huge. I don't know her. I know the name. Yeah, yeah. she she's this uh, a woman. Who started producing daily TikToks about? Oh you know, yes! Oh, and she's also awesome. paved the day. Yes, no, she's anyway, great. I mean, she's great. I've just been promoting you, but also <laughs> Miriam Management is really interesting. She yes. summarizes a page of Talmud in a very I am so jealous. It's very short <laughs> way, but she's gotten a lot of pushback. Yeah. Misrepresenting Judaism, being right. you know right. uh, very you know very beautiful woman yeah. talking about sort of these cute ways about yeah. very serious stuff in right. Talmud. Uh, and I'm sure you must have um, faced some pushback to the way you present. Um, oh yeah, but I, yeah, I, I, I'm, thank you for reminding me who she is, and I think what I think what she's doing is awesome. And I think it's like I think what's interesting is that Judaism has always evolved. It's always evolved, always evolved. And as it as it evolves, people are going to find ways that work for them. Um, and the fact, I don't know much about her other than what I see on, on TikTok. Um, and here's this woman who loves talking, loves text, has internalized it enough and understands it enough to present it in a way that is palatable and acceptable, or not acceptable, but it is easily digestible to other people. And, and the fact that she can do that should tell people how much she actually knows. Mm -hmm. um, and if we don't lift people up like that, the last demographic study said we're about 1.9% of the population. If we hold on to a myth of how we used to be, we're going to shrink even more. Um, and, uh, and so like when, when I've had people not, well-meaning people, not so well-meaning people say, I'm dumbing down the tour. I said, no, I'm not. And I'll have an intellectual conversation with that. I'm trying to make Judaism uh, accessible, accessible to other people and make it relevant. Um, and, you know, I have people say things to me, you know, often, what do you think about Leviticus? <laughs> Let's talk about Leviticus. Like, <laughs> I have wrestled with Leviticus. I can tell you what everybody says about Leviticus, and I can tell you what I think about Leviticus. Um, but I think Judaism is wonderful, and the more people can show that, um, it won't, it'll, more people will stay, I hope. Or, and if they leave, that's fine too. But it won't seem so like far away. Yeah. Are there parallel yous in the reform movement, the conservative movement, the people doing this kind of work that you're doing now for reconstructionism? So, I have a counterpart in the URJ, the Union for Reform Judaism. Her name is Yolanda Savage-Narn. 
Um, she's not a rabbi. We have similar beliefs. We believe the similar, we, we have the same, we want the same things, we have different approaches. Mm -hmm. and, and because of that, we work together. Um, and uh, her, our jobs are slightly different. Um, you know, where I'm more connected with students and congregations. Actually, I can't. I don't. Know, I can't explain what she does. But we have different approaches, but we want the same same things. Mm -hmm. And that just mostly has to do with I, I use a rabbinic approach to do the work that I'm doing. She's using more of an executive director. I think I shouldn't say that because I don't know. But it's just different. So you bring what you know. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Can't pretend to be somebody. <laughs> Um, we're almost out of time, but I want to give you a moment, if, you, if you'd like, to sort of give a final message to our students in the audience and others as well, mm -hmm. what you want them to take away, what your vision that they can mm -hmm. bring to their future and to the communities, to, for themselves and for the communities that they can bring, that you want to, if you could give them a single message to walk away with, to, for, for, for now. Yeah, listen, I think what I, what my, right now what I want you all to understand is if you are Jewish, own your Judaism. Own it. Like, don't buy into somebody else's Judaism. Do your own learning. Do whatever it is that you like. But you know, but study or learn. But own your own Judaism. Don't let somebody else define your Judaism for you. When when I was at Elon, people would say, "Well, I'm just a cultural Jew, or I'm just this Jew." I'm like, "No, you're Jewish. It's all. We're all have different approaches to stuff, and our different approaches to our Judaism. But we're all Jewish." Um, and what was another point that's gone? <laughs> it's late for me. It's late. Uh, so I will say, if you ever want to reach out to me, I'm easy to find on social media. Somebody's already pointed out. You can find me on any social media platform as Rabbi Sandra. Feel free to I answer questions from people all the time. I really like answering questions for young people because I think that young people um, who are reaching out to me, even if they disagree with me, are open to learning. Uh, doesn't mean that uh, sometimes I do block people. But I don't block people for disagreeing with me. Uh, I've had people say that. I said, no, I block you because you have made some comments that are really inappropriate, and I don't want other people to hear them. Um, but yeah, like, own your Judaism. I think that's just like, well, what else? I love the expression. Yeah. And I should add that here in Jewish Studies, the College of Charleston, we have many wonderful classes that can help give you some of the tools that will help you decide the kind of Jewishness you want to have, or, or not. So we encourage you to take many variety of set classes. Um, thank you so much for coming and joining us here in Charleston, and have a wonderful visit. Thank you. I've enjoyed my time here. Thank you so much for all of you, the people on television. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.